Kennedys are amazing. We are so blessed. They're, 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 how unsearchable are his riches, Romans tells us. We can't even comprehend all the things God has done. And when you got saved, God just, boom, he did a whole bunch of things. You know, the rest of your Christian life will be spent learning about those things, trying to figure them out. How many amazing things he did in you and, uh, and, and what we are in Christ. That's our identity, and we'll do a couple more today. Ephesians 1 and verse, uh, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us, uh, us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will." to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll talk about some identities God has given us. Father, uh, we just come to you asking for your blessing, for your help. Lord, it's your word, it's your people, it's your Holy Spirit, and we know we need uh, we, we need your help. And we, we, you want to do the work, you promise if you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. We pray for the Holy Spirit to move. We thank you for a refreshing service already. We thank you've been able to praise you. Thank you you've been able to fellowship with some good people. And of course, right now we come to the most important time, the preaching of your word. And we pray that you would speak to us, make your word relevant, and, and specifically in our minds and hearts, speak to us that we would uh, become better Christians with my voice. And uh, help us um, to uh, please uh, have ears to hear as we uh, preach. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. This chapter starts off with, or this book starts off with the typical greeting. The Apostle Paul greeting the Ephesian church, the Ephesus church. Uh, the church at Ephesus was a, the, probably Paul's most important church that he started. He went back there and spent a, a prolonged period of time there. He placed his most important uh, trainee, which was uh, Timothy, over Ephesus. He did a pastor's conference there. It was a very important church to Paul. And he greets them, of course, as he does all of them, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus and the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace be unto you in peace. And that's how he typically starts off a, uh, uh, one of his books in the Bible. And he begins to talk about how God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is a super important doctrine to understand, that God has given us all we need. He's given us all spiritual blessings. You know, the Bible says this about the Scripture. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I found, and and, and the Bible teaches, and I found it true in life, is every spiritual need you have, God God has met that need. He has something for it. You do not have to live and be an incomplete Christian. As it says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principalities and powers. He said in the word, he gives us things we need to be uh, uh, complete and to be uh, perfect and do every good work. He's given us all spiritual blessings. If you're in a situation where you need strength in this area, it's something you've never been able to conquer, God has that. If you say, I have this thing over here, I just I struggle with loneliness, I struggle with anger, I, I struggle with pride, I struggle with lust, whatever it is, he's given us all spiritual blessings. The devil's going to convince you, okay, just take 75% of the Christian life and be happy with that. But God says, no, I bless you with all spiritual blessings. I knew who you were. When I got saved, I needed a father in my life. I didn't have a father my whole life. And God became the father of the fatherless. And I, I have a less of a father need than people who grew up with a good dad. Why? Because he blessed, he knew that need. He's able to meet the need that we have. And God is able to help you. You just draw near to God. He can help complete you and fix you and, and, and help you in every area. And he gives us those things. Colossians says this. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. He's blessed us in those ways. 
chapter 1 and verse 9, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now watch this word all and every, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and do all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Look at, look at all God has for us. He wants us to be complete. He wants us to finish all the things that we're going through. He wants us to get the victory. That's why he says we are complete in him. And so we're, we have all spiritual blessings, he tells us back in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. In verse 4, it says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, there's a lot there, and we'll, we'll finish the verse in a minute there. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the doctrine of God choosing is, is clearly in the Bible, okay? He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, the Armenian versus Calvinism and all the uh, theological debates. There's just, there's just two things that are in the Bible that they just can't deny. Both are in the Bible. One of them is God chooses things. He's sovereign. Okay? We see that in this chapter. And this is one of the, if you want to look up the sovereignty of God, Ephesians 1 is probably the second greatest chapter in the Bible for that. Romans 9 being the first. And then Ephesians 1 would be the second. He makes it very clear here that God chooses things. And uh, and <clears throat> in verse 4 and 5, it says, it says, according as he hath chosen us before him, uh, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinate, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So you look at that and you say, he chose us before the foundation of the world. That's foreknowledge. We see that he has predestinated us to be certain things. And we see that that's in the Bible. It's here in Ephesians 1. It's in other passages. However, you also, in Ephesians 1 and in all of the Bible, you see God, God giving us free will. Okay? It isn't one or the other. Okay? Just, for example, in this, in this, uh, in this chapter here, just to show you um, that free will is also uh, uh, found here. Um, look at verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted. After ye heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. All over the Bible, you have God is sovereign and God works, and you have free will. You have free will in Genesis 3. Of all the trees of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou mayest not eat of it. It's a choice. Revelation 22, the end of the Bible. Start, in the start of the Bible, you got free will. Revelation 22, whosoever will may come. Whosoever is thirsty, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. If any man open the door. Free will is all over the Bible. See, God is greater than your and my comprehension. God is able to be sovereign and choose. And he, and he does sometimes, not always, sometimes lets men just run their own route and people have free will. Um, but God is also a God who gives us free will and he right immediately in the Garden of Eden, he did that. You see, I don't understand how those two work together. Well, the Bible says in Isaiah 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is just able to be both allow free will and to rule in the affairs of men. He can do both. Now, I, I've illustrated this many times with just simply understanding that sometimes I'm sovereign and sometimes I'm free will. Zach looks at me after he messed a song up there. Of course, he's looked at the leader then to bail him out. And he, looks at what, and he says, should I do that? And I just said, I left it up to him. He dug his hole. You know, you figure it out. And, uh, and so I, a free, free will Come, came in there, but sometimes I say, no, you're done. Okay, and I, I kick in sovereignty, right? I do both, Amen. right? We all do. Sometimes I say, where do you guys want to go? Where do you guys want to eat tonight? And then pff, starts the debate in my family because we're a family of strong opinions. And, and then sometimes I'm sovereign. And I say, we're going to Black Bear tonight. 
and, uh, and, and I'll tell them where we're going. And it, 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 God can do both, okay? I think the beautiful thing about this passage, okay, is that, that, that I love is he chose you from the foundation of the world. I think two things about that. Number one, God just chose you. If you're saved, if you came to Christ, God chose you. He said, I want you. You know, <clears throat> choosing somebody is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful in adoption. It's beautiful in marriage. It's, it's, it's when a, a, a man and a woman say, I want you. I'm choosing you. Okay? It's, that's the, we have that in America. We don't have arranged marriages. And, 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 and you choose. You want them. And, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. God chose you. And that he, did it from, he, did, he did it from the foundation of the world means he saw you in the future. That means he must have known the future. He must have known all you'd ever do, and he still chose you. Because he chose you from way back then. And <clears throat> that means, God, there's something special about you to God. He picked you. And that's a beautiful thing. And and yes, you got to say yes or no. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever is in there. But he he chose you. It's a beautiful thing. Blessed be God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he, hath cho- as he hath chosen us in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world. And then notice what he chose us to be. Because he did choose us to be something, according as he had chosen us, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. <clears throat> Finish that verse, because it says he chose us to live a godly, holy life. And that's God's plan for all of us, is for us to be, first of all, his child, and to be saved, and then to be holy. And that's what he chose. It's, it's what God wants for us to be. If you look at chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Romans 8, we're not going to go there, but it says the same thing, that God has predestinated us to become like Jesus, to live a holy life. He ordained it. It's his plan for us, and he has a plan. And so God wants to do that. <clears throat> Why did he save us? Why did he choose us? What does he want for us? Well, it's amazing because he says pretty specifically in this, in this verse, in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That phrase is the little wordy there. When it says the praise of the glory of his grace, you're praising something. You're praising the glory. The glory in the Bible is like the glory of God. It's the shining. It's, it's the beauty. It's the wonderfulness of something. You're praising the glory of God's grace. What God wants you to do, he chose you and he saved you and he worked in your life and he, and he blessed you with all spiritual blessings that you would praise the glory of the grace of God because the grace of God is so amazing. See, God in his mercy doesn't punish us, but grace is beyond mercy. Grace, mercy is not getting the punishment you deserve. That's what mercy is. Grace is God giving you blessings and favor that you don't deserve also one is not getting punished but one is blessing in good things and god gives you many good things it says we already read that and he was god did this so you would say wow god has given me grace he has not only saved me but he's given me spiritual blessings in heavenly places and he's done a whole bunch of incredible things for me and to praise his grace verse 12 says this again it says uh, um, that we should uh, be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. We're supposed to be bringing glory to God and loving on the Lord and saying something. When you sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, you are praising the glory of his grace. And that's what he wants. He saved you to, to make you shine and give glory to him. He's God. It's not all about you. You enjoy all the benefits. It's like if I said, hey, man, I'm going to give you a million dollars. I just want you to really thank me a whole bunch. 
That's a pretty good deal, right? And God blesses you and does all these things for you. He says, I want you to praise me. I want you to give me the glory due to my name. And, and so he gives you all these things and does all these things. And God's been good to us, amen? God's just done amazing things. And if, if you're saved and going to heaven, you're blessed. And he's been good to us. And we should uh, uh, really praise him for that. And then we get to... Um, we get to really what, what, our, what our first identity in Christ is, and it'll be most of the message, is in fact in verse 6, our memory verse, to the praise of his glo- the glory of his grace, wherein, inside of his grace, he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That is our identity in Christ. We are accepted in the beloved. As I prepared this series <laughs> nine weeks ago when he started doing it 10 weeks ago when he started preparing it this was going to be one of the first ones i did because it's one of the most amazing ones identities but it just the lord didn't have us do it until now in his grace he's made us accepted in the beloved to understand to be accepted in the beloved the whole phrase every word means something but to even understand his acceptance you have to understand how amazing that grace is you have to understand who we really are and our position in christ why do you have to understand that because the bible says we were his enemies i think we kind of think well yeah maybe i was bad or maybe i sinned or maybe i wasn't so great or maybe i was pretty good but maybe i need a little saving But God doesn't phrase it that way. He says we were his enemies when we weren't his, his, when we weren't saved. We were the enemies of God. I did not know I was the enemy of God, but I was. God in his mercy doesn't even let us tell us how bad we are. But we are sinners who need a savior because our sin makes us the enemy of God. That sin is what put his son on the cross. Sin is horrible to God. For one sin, he threw Adam and Eve out of the garden. And sin is so bad. The way you look at the worst sin, whatever you think the worst sin is, rape or child molestation or, you know, whatever, kidnapping, whatever you murder, whatever it is, whatever you think of that sin, God thinks of every sin worse than that. And that we do it totally offends him and separates us. Colossians says this. I'm going to read some verses about our what we are with. Because and, 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 it helps you understand how amazing this, this acceptance of us is. Colossians chapter 1 and uh, verse uh, 21 it says, and you who are sometimes aliens and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now have you reconciled. Remember that word reconcile? We get back to that. He said, God reconciled us who were his enemies. Romans chapter 5, and you don't have to turn to all these, but I'll be reading these. Romans chapter 5 and verse, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 says this. It says, for if when we were, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, being much more reconciled, we shall be saved from his life. There's that word reconciled again. When we were enemies, it says, we were the enemies of God. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, we were dead in trespasses and sin. We were spiritually dead. We were the enemies of God. We were far from God, separated, aliens, it says, from, the, from, from, from God. We were, we were totally separated in a different world from him. And, and God says, you are, you were separated from me. Yet now you're accepted in the beloved. This process comes through that word reconciliation. We just read it both in, in Colossians 1. You have to be reconciled in Romans 5, verse 10. He reconciled. The word reconciled means to make a debt equal. So when the Bible uses the word reconcile, it's kind of a big word. It's one of the words that's used for salvation. So imagine you're you're balancing your accounts and, you know, one account you got, you know, $500,000 and and then you you look at what your balance should be and you're missing, you know, $1,100. And so your other account has four, you know, 400, you know, uh, uh, 499,000, you know, you know, whatever, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and you're missing that one thousand, you know, eleven hundred dollars or whatever, and you're like, where did this money go? Why am I? This is not balancing out. This is wrong. 
So you go to a research, you call your employees in, and they said, oh, you know, I lost that receipt. I bought a piece of machinery for the company. I didn't bring you the receipt. That's what it is. And so you say, go back to the company, get the receipt. You bring the receipt back, and now you plug it in the computer, and now your, your accounts are reconciled, right? You've reconciled those accounts. So when we sin... The Bible says we owe a sin debt and we're out of balance. We owe a massive debt. The wages of sin is death. Christ, when he died for our sins, balanced that out. And so now we owe nothing because Jesus paid it all. He saved us the uttermost. He washed away our sin and he's reconciled us to God. He's taken away the debt and he's balanced it out. He used a second word, which is redemption in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. So he's reconciled us from enemies um, to make us accept it. He's also given us redemption. Redemption is a very similar word in the Bible, uh, the word redemption. And uh, the word redemption, um, it means to pay the price in full. He paid all of our debt. He went and paid for everything. And now we have had redemption. Now we've been reconciled. Now everything has been cleaned up. And now we are accepted in the beloved. God has gotten rid of our sin debt and we're accepted. He says, you no longer owe anything. You are not guilty anymore. We are reconciled to God, and that makes us accepted in the beloved. He paid our sin debt. But this goes far beyond just forgiveness. It says, in whom we have redemption, that's salvation. Okay? This is, this is really a big part of the message to get here, okay? Because I just gave you a bunch of doctrine and stuff. You really got to get this part here because it's, it's the amazing part. If he just saved us, that would be awesome. We we're going to hell. Now we're going to heaven for sure. Our sins are gone. Awesome. Praise Lord. That would be already, man, I won the lottery and, you know, my dog fetched the paper and my wife cooked me breakfast in bed. It's already, we're already set. I mean, it's already great. Amen. It's already good. But it's, it's beyond that. See, God didn't say, boom, say, all right, just go ahead and go to heaven. I'm done with you. <laughs> or, all right, you don't owe me anything anymore. Well, a lot of you don't owe me anything, right? Okay, good. You don't owe me anything. Well, there's a relationship beyond that where we can be friends. We can love each other. We can, we can be close. It's not just a matter of, okay, you don't owe me anything anymore. It, it's, it's, it, it goes way beyond that. And God takes us way beyond that and the way he phrases it and what he teaches us that it's 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 a very important how we say this this word that he says you're accepted in the beloved in the greek <clears throat> the word accepted and the reason it adds in the beloved to it, it it's really important because the word accepted is charitu is the greek word you, you would in that word you'd find the word um uh, uh the word charity okay Chiritu, and that's the that's the Greek word. The word means when it says accepted. The word actually means, and that's why it goes all the way accepted and the beloved to a very a very beautiful, sacred, close relationship. The word literally means special honor, highly favored. It doesn't just mean okay, I don't reject you. It means it's a reception of you of someone very special. The word's only used one other time in the Bible. Okay, I'm going to show you where it's used another time in the Bible. It's Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> and verse 28, the only other time this word, this same word is accepted in the beloved. The only other time it's used in the Bible is, is Luke 1 verse 28. And the angel came in unto her, this is Mary, Jesus' mother on earth, and said, Hail, Thou art highly favored. That's the same Greek word. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. The angel comes to Mary and says, Ma'am, you are highly favored. You are going to have the Son of God in your womb. That's how highly favored she was. That's the same Greek word that is used for us, accepted in the beloved. We are highly favored. 
That's your identity in Christ. That's who we are. Salvation, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, is just the beginning of this thing because he saves you, and but he, then he says, hey, you're favored. You have a relationship. I've made you my child. I've made you my friend. I've, I've espoused, I'm espoused you. We are close. We're going to go somewhere. We are in a relationship. And you, I really love you. And I really want to be close to you. And I really want you to be blessed in every spiritual blessing. You have been highly favored. And I've made you accepted in the beloved. That's the way God feels about his people. That's your identity. In, in Ephesians 1, verse 7, we see we're saved, we, in whom we have redemption through his blood, uh, the forgiveness of sins, um, to the riches of his grace. That's great, but that's not all he says. Look at verse 8. Wherein he hath accounted, uh, hath a, uh, he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us a mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. He says, I want to do things in your life and, and reveal my will to you and speak to you and abound towards you in mighty ways. Verse, uh, verse 11, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. There's the will of God. It's the third time he's mentioned his will. He has a plan and a will for our lives that we should be to the praise of his glory, which first trusted in Christ. He has an abounding thing. He has, uh, he has a, 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 a blessings toward us. He has an inheritance for us. Watch, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the, in the knowledge of him. He says, I want you to... I want God to speak to you and reveal things to you. The eyes of your understanding, verse 18, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him the dead. He says, you've got all kinds of treasures and riches and power and hope. I want your eyes open to it because you have all these riches in Christ. It's not just salvation. It's blessings and God working and God speaking and God revealing and God doing mighty things and being full of hope. This is part of the deal. It's not just salvation. Salvation's great. But I, got, I want your eyes open to what you got. You're sitting there a pauper and you got $10 million in the bank. I'm trying to help you understand you've been highly favored. He, he didn't just go and say, don't be homeless anymore. Let me put you in a shack. Okay, see you later. No. He gave you a house. And then he said, I've got, and, and I'm figuratively, it's not, I'm not talking health and wealth, prosperity, gospel stuff, but he's gone and he's given you blessings. And he says, I'm going to take care of you. And we'll get you training for your job in the future. And we got a plan. And we've got this. And you're going to go here. And you're going to travel here. And you, I know you like these things. And, and, got, and, and someday I got a, a spouse for you. And I've got some money in the bank for you. I got all these things. I've got a plan for your life. And it's awesome. There's all kinds of things you don't even know about yet. That's what the Christian life is supposed to be. You're accepted in the beloved. You're highly favored. I have things for you. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 are great verses. You're not saved by works. You're saved by Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Good. Everybody stops there. Look, we're saved by grace, not by being good. Awesome. But keep reading. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He says, look, God is forming you. God, you're his workmanship. He's not only saved you, he's going he's to start working and changing you, making you into what he wants you to be. He's got a plan. He's going to work in your life. He says, you're accepted in the beloved. See, because... Here's, here's what happens. Here's what uh, most people think. God is looking down on you. What are you doing? Not a good enough. Knock it off. Lightning bolt. 
And you kind of think, God's, God's doing that with you. And God's looking, going down saying, I love you. You don't have any sins. You're accepted and highly. I got all kinds of awesome things we're going to do together. Man, you are mine. You're my friend. God didn't like me. God's mad at me. Look. And you don't understand. You're accept, that's your identity in Christ. You're accepted in the beloved. Not because of you. It says, he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Most people struggle with this thing, with accepting the beloved, because they're trying to become accepted in the beloved by trying to earn God's favor. Save you a bunch of time and effort here. You're not good enough. You're not going to do that. He hath made you accepted in the beloved. He did it. Quit thinking it's you. But here's the problem. A lot of us, you've had people in your life that never accepted you. You had people in your life who drove you. And so you kind of get that in your mind. You know, you couldn't be part of the cool kids. You couldn't join this group. You weren't athletic enough for this. You weren't friends with this. Your, your, your dad was always saying, you know what? Never good enough, never good enough, never good enough, never good. Your boss never said good job. You ever had a boss that never said good job? Yeah, I mean, you're saying, had. <laughs> and no matter how much you did, they would never praise you. You get married to someone like that? They're always like, oh, well, it is a little burnt. I mean, they're always, there's always something wrong. And all of a sudden you think God's like that. But God removed everything between you and him and washed it away. And he says, you are accepted in the beloved. You're not interviewing you're already you're already in you're accepted and see because people don't understand this they don't understand god's nature they don't understand that he paid the price god's will is you serve him this way so the god's will is what happens is you like i did so i was at a big advantage i was so bad that i knew i would i knew I didn't deserve to be saved. I knew I didn't deserve God. And when I realized God had all these things for me, I was like, you got to be kidding me. But I came in not thinking I was good enough. I knew how bad I was. I, I, was I came in a crisis, messed up kid. I came in and I just said, man, if God will just save me, this is great. And then I started to find out all these things. The Bible says, man, I get this. And I'm reckless me who doesn't question things very much, you know. And so I just go in and say, okay, if I can pray, I'll do this. And I did that. He actually listened to me. He can use me. He says he can use me. All right, I'll do that. I never thought I'm going to earn anything. I already knew I couldn't earn anything. I was that advantage. And so I, what I did is by nature, thankfully, praise the Lord, I fell in love with the God who was so good to me that I decided to serve him with my heart. I wasn't trying to serve him so I could get him to like me. I wasn't trying to serve him because I was afraid he's mad at me. I wasn't trying to get him to serve me because he blessed me. I just fell in love with him because the Bible says this, 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. The greatest commandment in the entire Bible is love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength. Greatest, greatest commandment in the Bible, Mark 12, 29. That's the greatest commandment. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandment. See, Love is a far greater motivator than fear or insecurity or anger or anything else. Love is the strongest motivator. A mom will go, who's afraid of dogs, will go and fight a pit bull who's attacking her child. Is she afraid of the pit bull? Yes, but love is stronger than fear. And yes, you can serve God out of fear. And yes, you can serve God out of, I hope he likes me someday. You can do that. I'm just telling you, when you fall wildly in love with him, you'll be willing to die for him, doing anything he says, and it becomes a love relationship, and you love serving God. Yes, there's a boss who can drive you and push you and force you and watch you and yell at you. But you know, if you love your boss and love your job, 
You go to work and it's fun. And when you get the Christian life, when you realize he's accepted me, he saved me, he loves me, I'm his child. This is awesome. Lord, I can't believe it. I love you. What do you want me to do? You're not the Christian who says, how many times a week do I have to go to church? <laughs> Pastor, why do I have to pray? You don't even get it. If you treated your spouse like that, how many flowers do I have to buy you for Mother's Day? <laughs> it's our anniversary coming up. What is the minimum I can possibly say to you? How many times do I have to say I love you in order for you to be happy? <laughs> None! She already hates you. And my uncle, I had an uncle um, who is uh, super mechanical. And, uh, and guys in my, my family are all super mechanical. And my grandpa, they wouldn't let him go to World War II, my grandpa, because he was, they needed him in the States to f- keep things running here because he was exceptionally mechanical. His son is mechanical. His son um, liked trains. And he got a job working for GM. Uh, on the locomotives that GM made. And when they sent them all around the world, my uncle would go with them around the world and he would train the people to, to take care of the trains and work with them and how to work with these, 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 these things. I asked him, he's like 65. He's already very wealthy. He didn't need to work anymore. I said, how much longer are you going to work? He says, you know what? I'm still a kid playing with trains. I don't need to work anymore. But he says, as soon as I don't like trains anymore, I'll quit working. But he says, I'm, I love it. They, they, they send me overseas. I, they pay all my expenses. He says, yeah, I love going and working on trains every day and teaching people to work on trains. It's fun. They say, if you find something you like doing and get somebody to pay you for it, you'll never work another day in your life. And so when you decide to love serving God because you love him, because he's accepted you, you're in a different relationship than the Christian who's, who's out there burdened and living in fear and frustrated and trying to be good enough to get to God, and they never get good enough, so we feel like God's mad at them. Man, you're living this all wrong. Just say, I'm not worthy of anything, but wow, he's made me accepted in the beloved, highly favored. Wow, I am a royal priesthood. God's Goodness, why does God want to do, Lord, I love you. I'm going to serve you with my life. And those are the joyful Christians who nothing can stop them, who like serving God, who aren't complaining and whining all the time, who love the Lord, and they're serving gladly and willingly. Because love is the strongest motivator. He's made you accept in the beloved. Whether you believe that or not determines on how you live the Christian life. He saved you already. He just has a purpose and a plan. He wants to do great things for you. If I could illustrate it another way, let's pretend like a man has a castle and he has a kingdom and, uh, and he's, he's in his, in his palace and, and all of a sudden any, any, any enemy army comes after him and uh, starts attacking their castle and, uh, and, and boy, the king is way more powerful and, and he, and, and, and he's out there and he's watching and, and there's one guy leading the whole charge, the, 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 the person who's leading the enemies against them. And this guy's trying to get his people across the moat. And all of a sudden, he falls in the water with his arm and he sinks. Boy, the other army scatters and the king says to his son, the prince, hey, save him. The prince dives in the water, pulls him out, drags him into the, into the castle. He's expecting to be killed. He says, hey, let's let's clean him off. Let's take him up there. He takes him up into the palace. And he takes this enemy who tried to attack him. They take him in the royal baths, give him hot water, get him new, royal, beautiful clothes, take him out of there, brings him into the king's presence. The king says, hey, man, you okay? You won't. <laughs> what do you mean? You're going to kill me, right? He says, no, I'm not going to kill you. All's forgiven. Actually, I just fell in love with you. I really care about you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to adopt you. And you're going to be in my kingdom. You're going to live in the palace. You're going to eat our food, wear our clothes. You're going to be one of my children. That's what God did to us. And 
The king wants him happy. The king, king wants him to celebrate it. The king wants this guy, this former enemy, to talk about how wonderful the king is. The king wants him to be close to him. The king wants him to be blessed, and he has a plan for him, and all these things. And our king has a plan and blessings for us, and he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And you've got to believe that and return the love toward him. It's what he wants. He has a plan. He wants to work in your life. But because people don't believe in their identity, because they think... <laughs> How many of you had a driver, someone in your life, a mo- they just drove you? They never, you never did good enough. It was a mom, a dad, it was a, it was a, a boss, it was a teacher, it was somebody. Who, a coach, you ne- they never said good job. Who had that in your life? How many of you had that? <clears throat> a pastor. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it's frustrating, isn't it? God's not that. He, he's made you accepted and beloved. Start there. Take a big breath and say, God loves me. He's accepted me with all I am. I'm accepted in the beloved. You know what? He doesn't force me to serve him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I'm going to serve him because I love him. Pastor's not going to have to tell me to do stuff. Pastor's not going to have to be on my case. I love God. I love God. You're accepted in the beloved. Remember, he did this, not you. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. You cannot earn your way to, to, to please a holy God who's never even beheld iniquity. And sin is something outrageous. You're never going to be where God says, wow, you're amazing. I'm so lucky to have you. It's not going to happen. He did it. Jesus paid it all. Amen. Celebrated. Love him because of it. That's the Christian life. Salvation is through Christ. Service is because you choose to love him. And he's got a plan. And he's got everything you need to make that victorious life. He's got it all. Amen? Amen. Now look at the person next to you and say, I'm accepted in the beloved. Because you are. Amen? Amen. I gotta do, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to squeeze it in. You ready? Quickly. One more identity in Christ. We're in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. A lot of you relate to this. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, verse 17. And came and preached unto you, which were afar off. That's what we were from God. And there, and, and to them that are made nigh, that for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Praise the Lord. Access who are far off before. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You know, our second identity today, is just going to be a quick one, is you're a citizen of heaven. A citizen of heaven. I don't think I ever would have understood this thing at all if I hadn't, hadn't traveled so much. And if I didn't have a church full of so many immigrants. All the time we're dealing with immigration things in our church, we have things right now. We have some Haitian kids. We're trying to get back their parents who are in America and trying to get them out of the danger there. We, we have, we're getting people from Congo and the Philippines that come here and do ministry. And we, we've, we, we just, we have people in our church who are at every level of immigration from, don't ask what their level of immigration is, um, to all the way to people in our church who are uh, green card and people who are almost ready to become citizens. We always, we just have the diversity of, in our church all the time. And so I, and People tell me everything. People always tell me about everything. I don't know why they just tell me everything about their life, and they'll tell me if they're illegal or if they're whatever. And I, I you know, I, I if I if I if I went and talked to police of all the people that we I deal with, man, I could fill our you know RJC down there, and uh, and and so. <clears throat> But don't worry, those of you are starting to sweat. I'm not going to say anything, okay? And so we have we and and you know there's. There's something about citizenship that's amazing. It's a bunch of privileges. People in our church who want to travel with me in a mission ship, they can't go on a mission ship with me because they don't have the status. If they, they can leave the country, they can't come back. They're not a citizen, right? There's a bunch of things of citizenship that's amazing. You know, I... I talk to these missionaries so often, they're dual citizens. Their kids are always dual citizens because they were born there, but their parents are American. And they can go back and forth. Some of your, how, many, how many dual citizens do we have in here? A few. We have three or four. And uh, <clears throat> I'm a dual citizen. America and heaven. 
I don't go back and forth, you know, but, but, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a citizen of heaven. Amen. It says you're not strangers and foreigners anymore. Your citizenship is in heaven. Amen. This America, I'm just passing through here. My, my citizenship, my country is way more stable. I have way better leaders in my other, my real country. Amen. Right? It's not, you know, bad A or worse B. Right? <laughs> It's not that. <clears throat> My citizenship, your citizenship is in heaven. You're not home yet. Man, I go to some bad countries. I mean, they're rough. The people are wonderful. The country's disastrous. And I've been to countries, and I mean, I'm thinking, the hospitals are so filthy, I can't get sick because I can't go to the hospital. The hospital will kill me. I mean, the roads are unbelievable the roads are so bad and and the corruption you know and you know just the, the all they're just so bad it's too hot it's just not but i'm there 10 days and there 12 days and many times i've flown into some airport i land in miami i land in dallas fort worth i land in seattle or san francisco or where i'm coming from and i come back in america and i just about get on the ground and kiss the ground when i get in that airport Thank God for America. Those other countries, I can't say certain things there. You're really careful. You know, they're monitoring your internet. They block all kinds of things. They can arrest me if they find out what I'm doing. I can get kidnapped at any time. I mean, I'm just in all kinds of danger. And I just go back and I say, man, America's awesome. Let me tell you, heaven. <laughs> That's what I'm going to think about America. America. Goodness, get me out of this mess. Because heaven's perfect. Your citizenship's in heaven. I'm going to read just several verses and finish up. Second Peter. Uh, let, me, let me fly. First Peter. You're a citizen of heaven. That's your identity in Christ. It's already settled. The reservation, it says in 1 Peter 1, 4, is reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Strangers and pilgrims, those are fascinating words. The word stranger um, is the word xenos. We get the word xenophobe and things from that. It means someone who's different. It's a guest who is novel. That's that word means in the, in the, in, 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 when it says we're strangers. It's like it's like, you know, you can go to Seattle and you can look around, you can see people from every race and they're, they're probably born here. You know, we just were so diverse. But then you see somebody and you say, just because the way they're dressed or, or something about their bearing or something about their, their color or something, you're just going, they just got here. Or they're just visiting. You might see a Saudi prince and the Saudi prince has his guards around him and he's dressed that way and all the royalty and he comes in his private jet and you say, he's not, this isn't his country, he's just visiting. The Bible says that's what we are in this world. We're guests that are kind of different. That's what we are. We're strangers. We're just, we're just people who are doing some business here, which is reaching the world, glorifying God. Then we're going home. And then it says we're pilgrims. The word pilgrim, it means a resident foreigner. You're never going to be a, 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 you're never going to be a citizen of that country. You're just visiting it. You're known there, but you're different. That's what we are in this world. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven. Pol, uh, the word, the word, that word is, uh, po, po, uh, it starts with the word poli, politico, and which means it's your citizenship. This world and its system is just a temporary thing we're dealing with. Our citizenship and our permanent residency is in heaven. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 it says this, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of, of uh, persons ought you to be in all manner of conversation and godliness looking for and hastening in the coming of the day of God where in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It says, look, you should live for the next world because this world's going to all burn up. My last, 
last trip, I was in the Philippines, and I was in my room there, and uh, I went into the bathroom into my in my room. It's a little 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 room there, <clears throat> and man, out comes a, not an American cockroach, a Filipino cockroach. <laughs> Anybody ever seen big cockroaches? I mean, big cockroaches. This guy was all this big, and. Uh, and so he comes, and I mean, he's looking at me. I mean, he pops out, and, and you know, and, and I'm, and, you know, just, just jump, you know, and I'm not really queasy about bugs, but they were, it was big. You know, I'm thinking, you know, I think I'm, it's going to go in my luggage. I'm going to take it back, and then we're going to watch the news in six months. It, America's been invaded by invasive, gigantic cockroaches, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and I try to kill him. You ever try to kill a cockroach? These things are incredible. They hide, they take off, and in he was right there on the shower curtain. That, that's where I found, that's right. Yeah, it's on the shower curtain when I'm getting in the shower. Gigantic cockroach. <coughs> He's the one I see. <clears throat> I had a two-day battle with that guy. He could disappear. What did I do? I went to bed. What would you do about the cockroach? I don't know. I don't know where he was. Get him crawling. On, he wasn't crawling on my hair, at least. And, uh, and so... Um, but I don't know. If it was in my house, I'd have done something. Burn my house down or whatever I had to do, but I would have got rid of that cockroach, okay? But this, this, this cockroach, it doesn't bother me that bad. I'm staying in the room for a few nights. I'm going home. And our cockroaches, we don't have them, but I've seen them before. And they're little tiny guys. They don't scare you quite as much. They can't carry you away or anything. And, and so you, but I'm not that worried about it. You know, it's, it's that. I've had scorpions in my rooms. I've had every kind of critter you can imagine in my rooms. I've slept in the middle of the jungle and mud huts and everything. But you know what? I can do that. Because I'm going back home. And in this world, you're going to have some cockroaches. And uh, you're going to have some, some, some things in life. But this isn't your citizenship. Your citizenship's in heaven. Deal with it. Deal with the problems of this life, troubles, people, yeah. struggles. But realize your citizenship is in heaven. Amen. We're going to be different than the rest of the world because we're foreigners. They're going to look at us and sometimes not like us and sometimes mock us because we're different. Jesus says there's a bunch of ways, and we'll finish up here. John 15 and verse <clears throat> 19 says this if ye were of the world the world would love his own but because you are not of the world but i've chosen you out of the world therefore the world hateth you you're a foreigner you're different people would never be allowed to have racism against a foreigner and be accepted but they can do it against christians against godly christians even some christians will do that lukewarm christians do not like on fire christians John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for us. Verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is praying for us. Verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hateth them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou wouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You're going to get some persecution. You're going to be different. You're going to be mocked sometimes. But you know what? That's part of being a stranger in a different country. In this world, we're just different because we're citizens of heaven. And in, in heaven, they just act a little different. They love their enemies. They believe in holiness. They aren't trying to just live for money. We're just, we're just, we're just going to get some looks, some mocking. You go to church how much in a week? You tithe? Wow. Wow. It's okay. We're not of this world, even as Jesus wasn't. If we're of the world, the world would love his own. We're not of the world. But your identity is different, and that's okay. Rocks are all the same. Diamonds are, are, are more rare 
and precious. Amen? Amen. And let's make sure we realize we're blessed to be citizens of heaven. And we are accepted in the beloved. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to preach your word today. <clears throat> Lord, these, these identities are wonderful. We, we just, we could talk about them for so long. And we just pray, Lord, as we have both of them, we kind of had to hurry a little bit. I pray that you helped us to grasp them. I pray some people who, who do not, uh, who now know they're accepted and the beloved would celebrate that and serve you in love and enjoy. Yes, they would have holiness. Yes, they would strive to become a godly Christian and, and live in victory. But really, they would get, they would just do it because they already accept it and they love you back. We love him because he first loved us. And others, maybe that are too comfortable with this world and live in worldly, would realize their identity is different. Their identity is a different world. We're strangers and pilgrims, and the world's going to think differently of us. <clears throat> and that's okay. Help us, Lord, to live that way and accept these identities and revel in them, enjoy them. If somebody's not saved today, may they come to Jesus. And we thank you for these truths. In Jesus' name.